I have a question for you. What's the most popular, affordable isopod in the isopod hobby right now? Take a moment, think about it. Leave your comment in the comments below. Let me know what you think is the most popular, affordable isopod. Everybody loves rubber duckies. Everybody loves the Kubaris uh, species, the different species in the Kubaris genus. But that might be out of the price range of a lot of people. Well, let me tell you what I think is the most popular isopod. I think it's the zebra. Our granddaughter would certainly say that the dairy cows are the most popular, but everybody that I talk to, one of the first isopods that they want to get after they've played with the powder blues, the giant canyon, and the dairy cows is the zebra. Why is that? Because they're so distinctive in their color. Today we're going to talk about the zebra isopods, Armadillidium maculatum, and I'm going to share some do's and don'ts with you. So stay tuned. The isopod vlog. Before we get into today's video, we do have a special unboxing or unenveloping. And this is from Polly or Paul Dima from Vivariums in the Mist. So let's go ahead and open it. Oh yeah, that's right. I already I already opened it a little bit. Wait till you see this. I contacted Polly about this because I thought that this was so special and he sent me over a copy. Thanks for the little sticker. And check this out. What a cool isopod shirt. This is, this is really nice. And especially since it's in my favorite color, orange. Now I have a shirt instead of the Supreme Gecko shirt to wear for the isopod videos. And speaking of the isopod videos, I do want to thank Jesse McCoy from uh, Isopods of Eden for these wonderful, wonderful buttons. Both the Vivariums in the Mist and Isopods of Eden's links will be in the description below. Please make sure that you visit these wonderful vendors and support our isopod community. Thank you again, Polly, for this wonderful shirt. In today's video, as you might have guessed, we're talking about the zebras. This is, of course, Armadillidium maculatum. I'm going to go ahead and show you how we have them set up. I'm going to cover some do's and don'ts. But I want to preface this with a statement that what works for us might not work for you. And this is a shout out to Juan who does a lot of speaking on uh, tropical fish. As he pointed out again that everybody's situation is a little bit different. Everybody's house's temperature and humidity is different. Everyone mists or adds water differently. And everybody feeds a little bit differently. So again, what works for me might not work for you, but this is how we do it. And it seems to be working for us. First, let's talk about the tub size. It really depends on the number of ice pods that you're going to keep in the tub to determine how big the tub should be, but we always like to start with at least a six quart, six to nine quart tub, even for a very, very small number of isopods. But for zebras specifically, I like to go with a 15 quart. This size will give the isopods more room to regulate themselves as they need to. So the don't is don't use an enclosure that's a little bit too small, and the do is use at least a 12 to 15 quart. We like to provide a lot of ventilation. You can see some holes on both sides of this enclosure and three holes on, on the top. That provides a cross ventilation. A lot of people will say that the ventilation is the most important thing with zebras. I feel it's probably more humidity levels than it is ventilation, but it is important to have a lot of good ventilation on these isopods. Let's go ahead and take a look at the enclosure. I'll be talking about each element in this enclosure, but let's take a look at the isopods just real quick. This is a fairly nice group of isopods going right now. You can see why these are probably one of the favorites in the hobby. So let's start with substrate. I like to keep the substrate a little bit deeper for these isopods. 
The reason to have a little bit deeper of a substrate is it allows it to stay moister longer. A shallow uh, substrate will dry out a lot quicker. For substrate, one of my biggest don'ts is don't use koi fiber. It really doesn't add a whole lot to the isopods enclosure. I feel that it molds easily and actually after you use it for some period of time, it will actually start packing down too much. So that's the don't. What's the do then? Well, I like to use a compost substrate, one made up of mostly dirt or worm castings. I like to mix in dry deciduous leaves. I also prefer a nice Zilla jungle mix in, to be included. Mixed together, that provides a really, really nice substrate. I've asked a lot of people about this because we lost a, a number of zebras from our first uh, attempt at keeping zebras. And time and time again, I've heard people say that they heard that the substrate should be dry. But they lost their cultures of isopods because they kept their enclosure too dry. So looking at this substrate, I'll pull back a little bit so we can see the whole enclosure. I have sphagnum moss on the left, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But this substrate is moist all the way to the leaves. If I roll back these leaves, we would see that the substrate is very dry on this end. Having a moist end and a dry end allows the isopods to regulate to their requirements. Let's go back to the sphagnum moss. I keep about a third of the enclosure with sphagnum moss, and I can lift this up, and we probably will see a bunch of animals underneath the sphagnum moss. They need that moist area for drinking and also for molting. Let's talk about the rest of the decor in this enclosure. You can see this large piece of cork bark. We talked about the sphagnum moss. Again, I have deciduous leaves. That's oak, maple, any of the hardwood uh, types of trees. I also have decaying wood, and I feel that this is a real, real important feature in, in any of these tanks. This wood is soft enough that I should be able to flake the wood right off. So the don't in this situation is don't depend on cork bark as the only wood in an enclosure. While I have some isopods that will eat the cork bark, most won't. So you have to have some kind of a decaying wood included in the enclosures, especially for these zebras. Here's another feature of this enclosure. This cork bark spans both the moist area and the dry area, and that's on purpose. I like to have an area where the isopods can use this wood as a type of a bridge from the moist to the dry area. Let's talk about food for just a moment. What I found with zebras is that they really don't appreciate a lot of mold in their enclosure. So the don't here is don't overfeed your zebras. While springtails will help decrease that mold and take care of uneaten food, overfeeding just complicates the whole process. And the do here is provide a very balanced diet. I'm going to throw in some of our home blended food. Not a ton, just enough. They have the leaves, they have the decaying wood as well. And I'm going to go ahead and throw in a piece of butternut squash. Again, the genus of Armadillidium really enjoys more vegetable matter in their diet. And probably the issue that caused me the most difficulty in the beginning is misting. I prefer to mist only the sphagnum area. Let's see if I can go ahead and get a video of this. So I'm misting just the sphagnum area here. I'm not going to go through the rest of the tank and mist. I think that that provides too much humidity for these animals. And again, that's just my opinion, but since I stopped misting the whole enclosure, it seems like these animals just really, really took off. What do you think, isopod fans? Did I cover all of the basics? How are you doing with zebras if you keep them? If you have a secret, go ahead and share it in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll see you in the next video. 
Thanks for watching.